Greetings, my friends. We are all interested in the Plan 9 by 9 podcast, for that is where you and I are going to spend the next hour of our lives. And remember, my friends, podcasts such as these are made possible by listeners like these. Alan Weston Barger, Joe and Lucas Schultz, Ellen Jane Keenan, and let us not forget Rod Barnett. Let us punish the guilty. Let us reward the innocent, my friends. Can your hearts stand the Plan 9 by 9 podcast? For the first time, we are bringing to you the full story of what happened. What plan will you follow now? Plan 9. It's been absolutely impossible to work through these Earth creatures. Their soul is too controlled. Why do I get hooked up with these spook details? Monsters, graves, bodies. Oh, all right. Well, it was covered up by the higher echelon. I am a soldier of our planet. We did not come here as enemies. We came only with friendly intentions. To talk. To ask your aid for the whole universe. But your governments of Earth refused even to accept our existence. Flying saucers, Captain, are still a rumor. Now toddle off and fly your flying machine, darling. But if you see any more flying saucers, will you tell them to pick another house to buzz? Minutes later, the police arrived at the scene. Who found them? The man and girl. The morgue wagon ought to be along most any time. You get their statement? Yeah, they're pretty scared. Finding a mess like this ought to make anyone frightened. You believe there are such things as flying saucers, Colonel? I'll tell you one thing, if a little green man pops out of me, I'm shooting first and asking questions later. You realize there's a government directive stating that there is no such thing as a flying saucer. You're a headstrong young man. Those incidents in the graveyard these past few days has just got me worried. Don't like hearing noises, especially when you ain't supposed to be in. Yeah, sort of spooky-like. Shall we talk now or wait? Go ahead, my friend. Let's go ahead and knock this out and get yeah. this going here. And I'm, I'm ready to go. Uh, let's see. I've got my coffee. i got my water. i got my electrode gun. I'm ready to do this. Nice. All right, Scott, you good? You have metal to throw it against in case you need to break the connection. <laughs> just in case. Just in case. So let's Excellent. go ahead. We'll, we'll make some magic here. We'll kick this off. Love it. In three, two, one. We are more than halfway through Plan 9 from Outer Space. We're calling this Part 6 or Plan 6, minutes 45 through 54 of this epic film. I'm Derek M. Cook, as always, joined by my partner in crime, Scott Morris. Have you ever been to Hollywood? (laughs) So between you and I, Scott, who's Eros and who's Tana? Who's got to wear the skirt? I don't know if I have the hips for it. Yeah, I don't know if I do either, so... Anyway, tell you what, let's let our guest be the ruler, though, this time around. What do you think? Okay. All right, so our guest this week is a man that I met at the H.P. Lovecraft Film Festival in person a few years back. He's a filmmaker, uh, a musician. He's done a little bit of acting as well, and he's a podcaster. He actually had me on one of his podcasts, the Five Minutes of Bonsai podcast. It's Brett Stillo. How are you doing, Brett? Hello, uh, foolish Earth creatures. Yes, I'm doing good. I mean, I might have to channel Dudley Manlove, who was born in the San Francisco Bay Area. So I, I'm coming to you live from San Francisco, which has a lot of interesting Plan 9 connections. So, uh, but yeah, mm-hmm. Dudley Manlove, which is apparently his real name. Mm-hmm. Wow. Well, welcome to the show, Excellency. Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> foolish earth creatures. How are the dead ones? And yeah, I'm very excited to be here. Uh, where to begin? Love this movie. When was the first time you saw Plan 9? First time I saw it, a little story because, you know, of course, I hadn't heard of it until, was it the 50 worst movies of all time came out in the 70s, the Golden Turkey Awards, and then suddenly... It, it seemed to be everywhere. So I saw it, as I recall, for the first time on a on a great local TV show called Dialing for Dollars. Oh, OK. That was a, a wonderful sort of local movie game show. The gimmick was in between. They would call you up on the telephone and say, hey, are you watching our movie today? Can you tell us what the movie is? And you win like fifty dollars or something like that. But that was Dialing for Dollars. And by the end of the movie, the host, Pat McCormick, he was sort of biting his finger 
and just laughing and well, I you know it's I can't believe what I just saw, folks. Can you? That was a hoot. And uh, <laughs> that's awesome. Yeah, being a teenager, it kind of went over me a little bit. You know, you're kind of in a more analytical mood or state of mind. Like that didn't make any sense. Well, that was dumb. But yeah, you know, I've seen it numerous times. And uh, hadn't seen it in quite a while until a couple of years ago. I watched it again and I made the bold announcement or I just decided something. The last time I saw it, uh, you know, two years ago, I said to myself, you know, it's not that bad. It's not that good, but it's just it's not as bad as its reputation, I think, precedes it. It's it's weird. It's (laughs) wacky. Oh, yeah. But we can talk about bad movies. I mean, we can talk about some really bad movies. You know, and I think Plan 9 kind of opened the door to look at, if not for Plan 9, maybe Manos' Hands of Fate never would have seen the light of day. Maybe we wouldn't understand Manos. Maybe it takes Plan 9 for, you know, then you can watch some, like, then the room makes a lot more sense. I don't know. We'll talk off mic about Manos, but um, (laughs) yeah, yeah, I, I think. Can we talk about the room, too? Can we talk about The Room? <laughs> if, if you want, Scott. <laughs> I like that movie, but I'm weird. <laughs> hey, man, that's why we get along, brother. That's why we get along. I think this is a through line. This is something that a lot of guests have said, and, and Scott and I say it all the time. Plan 9 from Outer Space is not that bad. No. When you when you really look at it, and, and this has been a real interesting journey for Scott and I. Uh, he and I have talked quite a bit about how doing this podcast has forced us to look at this movie in a completely new way. And listeners stay tuned because the ninth part of our podcast will just be Scott and I talking about our experiences viewing the movie for the podcast. But this movie itself, it's got some great ambition. The execution's lacking a little bit here and there, but overall it's not awful. And I've had a real fun time doing this with various guests and getting their take and learning about their history of plan nine. And I think I speak for Scott when I say we're having a great time. Oh, yeah. Yeah. This movie does not deserve the reputation that it has. It also does not deserve the Golden Turkey Award or the worst movie of all time. Right. And as somebody who has been recently, I don't want to use the word obsessed, but uh, hyper aware of a movie called Fun in Balloon Land lately. Yeah. <laughs> Plan 9 from Outer Space is not the worst film ever made. Just saying. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> just say. I will actually mention, you know, my my personal favorite. I think, Derek, we've talked about Samurai Cop, which, <laughs> oh, you know, man. Plan 9 looks like a Spielberg production it, compared to Samurai Cop. It so. does 100 percent. Have you seen Samurai Cop 2? I've been afraid to watch Samurai Cop 2. Speaking of the room, Tommy Wiseau is in it. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, I, I guess if you're going to make Samurai Cop 2, you, you call Tommy up. Exactly. You know, watching this particular segment and really trying to get into the mind of Bunny Breckenridge, much like uh, an FBI profiler, I, I, I feel like maybe Tommy is the Bunny Breckenridge of, <laughs> of our generation, so to speak. Oh, you okay. Know, sort of this, you know, of course I'm a great actor because I enunciate. <laughs> you see, the key to great acting is to say certain words louder than other words. Oh, okay. That's how you do it. That's great acting. I can't uh, tell if the vision I'm having right now is genius or horrifying, but is there a plan nine from outer space where we make somewhere in the future with Tommy in that role? Oh, oh boy. I know who would buy the first ticket. <laughs> I, he probably wouldn't do it, but I would, I would cast Tommy. Well, either in Lugosi's role, I get, didn't just give that a bigger role or, you know, maybe Tor Johnson. I don't know. I don't know. But, uh, <laughs> I just saw this guy in concert, so he's he's kind of been on my mind. I would love to see the Supreme Leader played by Peter Murphy of Bauhaus. <laughs> just doing that, you know. And hey, Bella Lugosi's dead. So, you know, it's it's just an obvious tie-in to bring me. It all, bring it all around. Before we dive into the segment itself, there is a question that we're asking every guest uh, that comes on the show. And Scott, if you want to take it away. Yes, uh, we know this Plan 9 that the aliens had was raising the uh, dead from the planet. What do you think one of the first eight plans are? (laughs) Um, That, that opens up a whole, whole huge barn of possibility. You know, one thing I got to say is, you know, when the again, the last time I saw this two years ago, and I hadn't seen it in about 10 years since then, I hadn't realized 
it's not just a, a flying saucer movie. It's a flying saucer conspiracy movie. And it really ties into the, the beginnings of the, the conspiracy movement with, you know, Donald Kehoe and his books. So I don't know. Plan eight might be, you know, replacing all the water on the earth with jello. <laughs> I like that. That okay. could be one. I think uh, plan six or plan five. I think peeps are involved. I think the animation of peeps. I think, you know, I think if we do look at UFO conspiracies and that whole theory of, you know, black science and technology and certain, you know, certain technology we have today is from alien technology. I think peeps is is alien tech. <laughs> No human could come up with peeps. <laughs> Scott, you're in trouble because I know your wife, Tracy, loves My peeps. My wife loves peeps, but she, the thing is she likes to buy them, crack open the package, stick it in the f- cabinet for about two or three weeks, and then she likes them better stale. So I don't know what's going on there. Well, oh. Thus neutralizing <laughs> the radioactive uh, <laughs> filaments that the rays. So that's why your wife has never become a zombie. Well, that... <laughs> She's what? neutralized the evil of the peep, <laughs> and there you go. And suddenly the show has become the peep minute. I hey. I cannot wait for her to listen to this episode. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait for you to watch her eat a peep after listening to this episode. She oh. might she might look at it and set it down and pick it up again. There might there may there may be some tension there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I love it. You know, peeps and jello. Yes. You know, the the answers that we're getting for this question from everybody, just all over the map. And uh, and this is perfect. I mean, it fits right in with everything else we've gotten. So, And, and listeners, uh, stay tuned because another thing that Derek and I are going to do on that ninth episode is we're both going to reveal our thoughts for one of the first eight plans. And ironically, we've kind of talked to each other a little bit. We came up with the same thing at one point. I'll just leave it at there. You know, we got to get something totally different at this point. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Independent of each other. Well, I mean, again, this is cons- in this conspiracy theories. This is a form of remote viewing. Hey, there you go. <laughs> you know, I think this is, I think there's a higher power that may be controlling you, sending these messages into your brains. Straight Anybody want to peep? I'm dying for one right now. Peep. Yeah, there are on the shelves now, right? You can get one, right? Yes, yeah. Easter's not that far away at the time of this recording. Okay, so this is probably as good a place as any to cut in and kind of discuss briefly about what's going on with Plan 9 by 9. Now, I've mentioned this in a couple of places over at Monster Kid Radio. I am committing to have the rest of the episodes out by the end of the year. I really have nothing to blame but myself. This has been a real learning experience for both Scott and I when it comes to... uh, producing a podcast uh, on top of our regular podcasting duties and everything else we have going on in our non-podcasting quote-unquote real life. I want to thank everybody for their patience and stay tuned because like I said, I am committing to get the rest of the plan nine episodes out by the end of the year. And then as far as any of the extras and the bonuses and the stretch goals and all that, we'll be completing those early 2020. So stay tuned. All right, so let's talk a little bit about this segment here. It's minutes 45 through 54 uh, of Plan 9 from Outer Space, and we begin in the Pentagon listening to the last part of Eros' transmission. They're destroying the entire universe. We are a part of that universe. This is our last... That's the end of that one. Atmospheric conditions in outer space often interfere with transmitting. How many of these recordings do you have, General? Uh, It's Colonel Edwards and General Roberts listening, and we started the recording in the last segment, so we're just kind of wrapping up now. They turn it off, and General Roberts gives Colonel Edwards his orders. You're going to go to San Fernando and see what in the hell it is they want. And and I love his delivery there. That's Lyle Talbot just knocking it out of the park. Knocking it out of the park. I love that. Yeah, one one of the things I noticed, and, and I uh, teased this to Derek before we started recording, is one of the things I really like, uh, Colonel Edwards asked the question of how many recordings that the uh, Pentagon has of the aliens, and he his line is something like, an even dozen up to now. This was the last one. And I'm thinking, a dozen? They could release an album now. They got enough tracks. <laughs> I want to hear that album so bad. That'd be great. <laughs> 
that all that's also like plan four. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> Darn, you know, now I gotta come whole, up with something else. <laughs> what were you really gonna do? Blitz, you know, we release an album of the, you know of our greatest hits, <laughs> and there's you know somehow you know we you know Monogram Studios is turned over to Ed Wood, and he becomes you know he finally becomes the mogul he's always wanted to be. But yeah, Lyle Talbot and Tom Keen, you know, really veteran B movie actor. Th- this is an interesting moment for me to come in on. Mm-hmm. Because it, yeah, it just seems like the first two minutes or so it just seems like a good old fashioned uh, sci fi B movie. Sure, there's some wacky camera movements, but you know, Lyle Talbot as general exposition is just laying it out. And uh, you know, this this is what good actors do. They deliver the lines, and you almost wonder if if Lyle looked at the script and went, "Oh hell," and he just you know he took a pen and he made some additions and it's just it's very smooth and you know this could be a scene from i don't know the giant claw or atomic submarine or take your pick beginning of the end it's it just seems like yeah we're we're in b-movie land and here's two guys in uh, in khaki uniforms so they must be in the military a little tangent for me here uh-huh. my love of khaki uniforms you know that what they're wearing is i can't remember if they're army or their air force but it's the old fashioned summer uniform that it must have looked good in black and white movies because it seems like whenever you see a military man, an officer in one of these movies, it's a it's a khaki uniform that they I don't think in the armed services they wear khaki uniforms anymore. I think they're diff- darker colors. But that just to me says sci fi B movie. You know, it's that tan look. It's the 50s and there's a guy in a in a light colored uniform and he's got a bunch of fruit salad on his uh, on his chest. So here we go. You know, now that I think about it, and it's something that I hadn't really considered, but you're absolutely right. I I think every military official I've ever seen, and especially in the 50s, in movies like this, or even, you know, bigger budget affairs like Invisible Invaders or something like that, they're all wearing, huh, tan or khaki. Yeah, I, I, I just got to put it together, like previewing the minutes last night. It's like, yeah, you know, it's, I think that, uh, you know, I did, I tried to look up a little military history. I think the khaki uniform was declassified or whatever it did, you know, they stopped using it sometime, you know, in the late sixties around Vietnam. But again, I would imagine just that shade probably looked good in a black and white movie. That was what they wore back then. That was a standard service uniform. And yeah, it's just, it's kind of one of those staples. It's almost a trope. Yeah. Uh, And, uh, and Lyle looks good in a uniform. How many times did, did old Lyle wear a uniform in movies? Right. They both look great. But speaking of uniforms, we, we have to go back up into outer space and hang out some more with Eros, Tana, and the ruler. And I love the ruler's get up. I need to get that crest that he's got on his chest. I need to take a screen print of that and put that all over stuff. Because that's just, uh, nobody would know what it is except for maybe a handful of people yeah. would know what it is. But I love it. Two things about that costume. One, yeah. do you think it was left over from, say, you know, a, an Ivanhoe B movie? from like 1953 or some Republic serial. Um, and two, do you realize how close you could have been to owning it about six months ago? Oh, that, that self same tunic I found online. It was auctioned off last October. It is now in someone's private collection, man. If we had known that we would have made that a stretch goal for the Kickstarter for this thing. Oh, heck yeah. <laughs> heck yeah. I'll send you guys a link. The, uh, the auction site is still up. And uh, it's it's pretty cool. You can see the inside of it. There's an old Western costume label. So I bet you that was something that was in a costume warehouse. Of course, personally, I'd like to think that was in Buck- Bunny Breckenridge's closet when he was doing Shakespeare. And it's just like that was his favorite tunic, you know. I'm, I'm performing in Richard III. <laughs> and he just, he, yeah. you know, being the Shakespearean actor he was, he was just always ready to go. Yeah. But the ruler's giving him a bit of a dressing down. Um Oh, gosh, yes. They, they've only gotten three of the uh, deceased humans up and about. Uh, the ruler says he needs the, the other ships elsewhere doing other things. So Eros and Tana are on their own. They've got the one ship and that's it. And one thing I've always wondered, what is he doing with those other ships? Why does he need them elsewhere? And now I want to know what the adventures of Bunny Breckenridge were in the Plan 9 from Outer Space universe. Yeah. Now, see, when I see that scene... I'm thinking, I have altered the plan. Pray I do not alter it further. (laughs) (laughs) 
Now I want to hear Bunny Breckenridge doing Darth Vader's line from Star Wars. That's great. Oh, man. Man. The Peter Cushing of Poverty Row, gentlemen. <laughs> oh, even. Oh, yes. <laughs> Bunny nice. was around in the 70s. If if he somehow Ed had tried to make a, you know, a Star Wars ripoff in 78, 79, call up Bunny. He would have been up in Carmel. Of course, my dear boy. I'll be there in a minute. <laughs> and uh, yeah. Oh, man. Well, he wants to see one of the specimens. Bring the specimen in. So they bring in Inspector Clay. And Tana's gun stops working. So Inspector Clay manages to get all the way to Arrows, puts his hands around his throat. Tana finally knocks the gun on the ground to unjam it and is able to use the electrode to make him stop. Yeah, yeah. It. You know, that whole sequence kind of doesn't make sense. There's something said, a little odd about the logic of that. You it's sound surprised. As if they were making it up as they went along. What I want to know is there's a line about bringing the big one with your small electrode gun. And how many takes did they do? It was bringing the little one with your big electrode gun. Oh! <laughs> and they had to redo that shot. Uh, I even wrote that down. That is a weird bit of very specific uh, description there. Bringing the big one with your small electrode gun. I don't. Hmm. There's another thing that I noticed while watching it this time. When Tana turns and leaves to go get Clay, she goes through that curtain, and for a split second, you can see the doorway. And the doorway has got the rounded edges. They're on the set of the inside of the spaceship that we've seen already. That's the same set. They just put the curtains around. Hey, nice. <laughs> you know, uh, yeah. it's, it's the contrast here that you have Again, we start off with Lyle Talbot, Tom Keene. They, I'll, I'll bet you between the two of them, they were in 500 movies. Bit parts, B-movies, serials. They did it all. I'll pick you up on that bet, Brett, because I checked the Internet Movie Database, and between the two of them, they had only 282 film appearances. Only 282. Tom Keene appeared in 95 films. Lyle Talbot appeared in 100. 87 films so i kind of wish we had set some stakes because uh i would have won then you have dudley and bunny who you know yes i was doing dinner theater in san bernardino and it, it, you know it's it's it, don't let the inmates run the asylum <laughs> i i wonder was it ed just being ed and that's great yeah yeah enunciate i love it or was Bunny too much for him? And like Bunny just took over the scene or, or was, you know, did, did Ed just let Lyle and Tom do their thing? And they, you know, again, the contrast between, you know, two actors who know what they're doing and two actors who don't know what they're doing. <laughs> I have taken two ships from your command, but that will leave only my ship. It is necessary that you continue your mission alone. I have need of your other ships elsewhere. When Tana leaves, and yeah, there's the weird dressing down. Even though you have risen three of the Earth's dead, the plan is far from successful, and you, Eros, must prove it an operational success before more time, energy, ships, and your countrymen may be spent on it. We will not fail. Everything is on our side. Not us everything! You do not have the live Earth people. It's almost like Bunny goes to Ed and says, I want more lines. I want a bigger scene. Um, okay, why don't you talk about flying saucers? It sort of shows that Eros is in charge of this big mission, and yet they're cutting off his, his number of ships. <laughs> it's, it's like going to Eisenhower on D-Day and say, yeah, yeah, we got some budgetary cuts. Could you, <laughs> could you do this with like 500 guys and one glider? The invasion yeah. of the Earth. Give yeah. Some slack. Well, they do have the big one. They do have Inspector Clay. Maybe <laughs> maybe that was enough to uh, impress the ruler. And I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm reaching here. Uh, yeah. But speaking of him being the big one, they, they are quite, or the ruler is quite impressed with Inspector Clay's size. Are they all this powerful? Yes, he's a fine specimen. Are they all this powerful on planet Earth? 
This one is an exception, Excellency. He certainly is. He's the exception because he was the one they were able to get on set that day, apparently. Right. Um, <laughs> can, you know. may, may I entertain you with a Tor Johnson story? Please do. I've become a big fan of the TV series Peter Gunn. Okay. That you can watch for free on Amazon Prime. And well, now that song's stuck in my head. Thank you. Well, that's, that's not a bad song. That's true. That's true. It's an awesome stuck. song. Okay. <laughs> and uh, and you guys might know this, but you know who's I, I always thought that was Henry Mancini himself playing piano on that track, but it was it was actually his assistant, an arranger by the name of Johnny Williams, who's playing the piano. I'm not yeah. surprised to hear that actually, because he makes do sense, a lot of television right? at that point. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's John Williams entry into uh, film scores was through Henry Mancini who uh, hired him and he was yeah, he played piano on all those tracks from Peter Gunn. But very cool, very cool. Yes. I'm watching this one Peter Gunn from about 1960. And, you know, these gangsters have it in for poor Peter who have him, they have him trapped in an abandoned hospital. And, you know, one gangster says to the other, get Bruno. And you don't know who Bruno is. You see this very stylized, noirish POV shot of someone coming towards Peter Gunn and Peter's trapped in this corner and how am I going to get out of this one? And suddenly the door opens and there's a big reveal and it's freaking Tor Johnson doing the Inspector Clay face, doing the Beast of Yucca Flats face. And Peter Gunn gets into a fight with Tor Johnson and I'm, I'm kind of just, my brain freezes up. It's like, what's Tor Johnson doing in an episode of Peter Gunn in 1960? And, did he just, did, you know, how well known was Tor, like from his wrestling career? And was just, just, you know, every time you saw Tor, you know, he would be doing that weird frozen face. Because it's, it's the exact same expression. <laughs> so it's almost as if, you know, they called in Peter Gunn to fight the undead. Now that's a movie I want to see. Yeah. Or, or at least a bit of fan fiction would be fun to read. Uh, so that was an episode in 19. 19- oh, okay. <laughs> So that was a 1960 episode of Peter Gunn. Uh, the episode was called See No Evil. Yep. And I'm going to go track that down now. That sounds like fun to watch. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a kick because, you know, I, I, I didn't know it was coming. I've, I've, kind of, I've kind of given you guys the spoiler, but it's, it's classic Tor Johnson. If you're a Tor Johnson fan, you must watch this episode of Peter Gunn. Available on Amazon Prime. This show has given me so much while we've been recording it. And having somebody tell me that there is a quote-unquote classic Tor Johnson it's right up there with some of my favorite moments of this show so far. Man, <laughs> it's just, classic Tor Johnson. And, yeah. of course, I'm just nodding my head saying, yeah, of course. Yeah, I know exactly what you're talking about. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's the classic Tor. It's the it's that face, which, like I said, you know, with his wrestling career, maybe that was I – mean, that had to be one of his gimmicks was, you know, I'm going to do that monster face. And, you know, the, the crowd's going to love it. If he didn't do it, you'd be disappointed. The movie Ed Wood, the Johnny Depp film – Kind of make it, makes it sound like Ed Wood discovered Tor, right? But mm. Tor Johnson had done a lot of acting. Uh, going as far back as the 30s, he was doing a yeah. lot of uncredited work. So he he had been kind of petering around Hollywood for a while. And Plan 9 is what made him infamous for us. But you know he did, did other things as well. So that's kind of cool to have that uh, Peter Gunn episode to look forward to. That'll be neat. Uh, let's see. So we have Inspector Clay. Uh, they get control over him and... They discuss a little bit more about what the plans are going to be. They're going to have the dead recruits march on the capitals of the world. Now, that's a shot I would have liked to have seen Ed Wood pull off. <laughs> or not. Well, <laughs> you know, I hate to think what, what he might have pulled from the film archives, but this does lead me to a, a what, what may be considered a controversial fan fiction option. Uh-oh. Dare I bring up the possible connection between, quote-unquote, the worst horror movie ever made and the greatest as the supreme leader is discussing his plan to have you know hordes of undead you know sweep over the earth i'm thinking about night of the living dead it's barely mentioned but the whole mystery of the venus probe and the radioactive material that apparently awakens the dead and you know i, I had to think could Night of the Living Dead be an unofficial sequel to Plan 9? Is that Plan 10? 
Well, it is now. Thank you for correcting my head cannon. <laughs> <laughs> I cleaned your head cannon. Yes. Plan nine fails, so as a last ditch attempt, they do something massive that raises a lot of the dead at the same time, and then we yeah. get Night of the Living Dead. Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm picturing, you know, on their alien world, some eager lieutenant comes up. Hey, remember the Eros plan? Oh, in 59, don't remind me. No, 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 no. I got I got an idea. I got what if we just what if we just, you know, load a satellite with goo and send it towards him? No fuss, no muss. All right, kid, but it's your future. There was a new supreme leader at that time. The old supreme leader had been fired. I think we could tie both movies together and uh, begin a cinematic Armageddon. It's end of days. Um, I kind of want to stop doing this podcast right now and just sit down and write that out because that sounds <laughs> amazing. Do. You know, both films, public domain, so we can pull footage from both. Make a little YouTube video out of it. I mean, that this sound, this is gold. This is amazing. Yeah. I, I love this. Yeah, Derek, feel free to like maybe take that out and just run with it. <laughs> you know, and just own that and... It's oh, it's wow. yours, baby. If you if you if you get the comic book deal with it, I don't know. Just buy me lunch or something like that. And we're gold. This so, is, yeah, this is brilliant. Oh, Take it, wow. and run with it. All right. Romero and Wood are in you know <laughs> in the great beyond laughing about this one. We just created the most bizarre of cinematic universes. I love it. <laughs> oh boy. All right. Um, back on track. <laughs> Yeah, where do we go from here? <laughs> Colonel Edwards uh, uh, arrives at the Trent house, and they have a bit of a conversation on their patio deck. He's also there at the police uh, officer as well. Um, the character's name, is, I'm blanking on I didn't write it down, actually. Oh, you know, Inspector Detector. Lieutenant Harper. Ah, there we go. Played by yeah. Duke Moore. Yes. Duke Moore. He should just hit the character should just be Duke Moore. Yeah. Duke is a great name. It's a great yeah, name for a cop in a movie is. like this. Uh, they have a conversation on their patio out back about what's going on. The trench tell Colonel Edwards what they saw. And in a weird bit of actual, efficient, competent filmmaking, Edward does not have them recap everything. They cut away to something else, and when they cut back, the conversation's over, and they're wrapping up. We know what they talked about because we've been watching the movie. I thought this was incredibly competent for something coming out of the mind of Ed Wood. I don't know <laughs> if it was a matter of, you know, they didn't have uh, Tom Keen that long, and they didn't want to waste time or whatever, but it turns out to be a great bit of filmmaking here, and I, I was really surprised by it. That brings up a good point. I mean, in terms of Ed Wood and his writing and his filmmaking, I, the good and the bad, I, I feel like he's just a guy who has some good ideas, but he takes them too far. And he needs, he just couldn't self-edit. And, you know, and yeah, this is a case where it harkens back to the earlier scene with Lyle Talbot. It's just some good exposition. It's just a solid, uh, workable medium shot. Everybody's going through the motions. It works. The only th question I have is is Gregory Walcott, who looks slightly dazed. You know, he's just sitting there, just staring, and uh, it, that that could be acting. You know, he's thinking about the strange experience, or is he just thinking about <laughs> how did I get in this movie? How do I get out of this movie? So one of the uh, Kickstarter rewards, uh, one of the stretch goals when we launched the Kickstarter to get this thing going was that ultimately Scott and I are going to record a fan commentary for this. And I, I think we just stumbled across the name that we're going to give the file uh, or track that we create. And that's going to be called That Could Be Acting. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think this this movie – you know, there are all these moments where you wonder what's on the actor's mind. If we go back to minute 135 in this sequence and you see Lyle Talbot's frantically going through some files, I, I almost wondered, is, is that where Ed's check was for his appearance? Is it like, you know, <laughs> yeah, I'll be in the file on your desk and, uh, you know, and I'll be right back. I'm going to I'm going to the delicatessen. And so Lyle, like, all right, where's my check? I'm done here. I was going to say probably what was on most of the actors' minds, will the check bounce? Oh, God, yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, this sequence also has one of my favorite exchanges of dialogue. This is the most fantastic story I've ever heard. And every word of it's true, too. That's the fantastic part of it. It's almost like Criswell himself wrote that line. I would say the movie started with lines like that. So. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, and then we're going to wrap up this sequence with an appearance from everybody's favorite patrolman, Kelton. 
is going to be in here as well because uh, Lieutenant Harper's going to ask him if he saw anything, if he saw that light. It's too dark, Lieutenant, but something started stinking awful bad. Yep. <laughs> oh, Paul Marco. Paul Marco was amazing as Patrolman yeah. Kelton. Yeah. Again, I think that's part of what makes this movie work is these amazing characters, you know, real life characters, not the characters they're playing, you know, Paul Marco and Bunny Breckenridge. And, you know, I think, I think they, you know, they lived together for a time and it's like all these are just crazy people that uh, Ed Wood found and, and gave them roles. They all lived in that house that the zombies ended up surrounding in Night of the Living Dead, right? <laughs> they sure did. Yes, they yes, sure, they did. sure did. So I have a question for you guys yeah. about the end of the sequence. Okay. I'm assuming when we see, uh, what's Lugosi, the name of Lugosi's character again? I don't think they ever gave him one. He's just the old man. The it? old man. When we see the old man with his cape up, I, I, I'm assuming that's Forrest J. Ackerman. I'd heard that Ackerman subbed for Lugosi in a couple of scenes in this. I have never heard that before. It's kind of no, I, I've always heard that it's his wife's chiropractor. Right, right. That was the person who like comes out of the crypt and everything. But well, a- any time that it's being held up in his face, that's who it is. That's what I've always heard. Yeah, and I'm I'm totally happy with the wife's. I like I kind of like that one better. And then that little tiny shot. It maybe lasts five seconds, but Bella coming out of the woods into the graveyard. Is that, in fact, possibly the last piece of footage ever shot of Bella while he was alive? I'd like to know. I wonder if there are, I'm sure there are records somewhere to kind of show the production schedule here and where this footage came from. Because the Lugosi footage was all shot before they did Plan 9. It was all something else I would have done with them. But I wonder, like chronologically, is it that or is it him smelling the roses outside of their, his house at the very beginning of the film? Hmm. Either mean, way, it's it's kind of fitting. You mean outside of Tor Johnson's house. Well, that's true. Yeah, that was really Tor Johnson's house. Wow. But yeah, that that struck me that here's this legend and he's he's in the cape and he's it's the whole costume. Just the way he's walking. Yeah, he he looks kind of frail, sickly, and I just I just froze as I was watching it and thought, man, is is that it? How ironic that that could be the last piece of footage of this legendary actor. You know, in some ways it's anticlimactic, but it's, you know, it's a bittersweet thing. Now it makes me wonder if Ed Wood shot any other footage that he couldn't figure out how to use. I wonder if there's anything else out there floating around. I know when Ed Wood got evicted or, or had to leave one apartment at some point, there are stories that a lot of film was lost at that point, that he had to leave a lot of it behind. It was either film or scripts, but something was left behind. And I do wonder if there's anything else out there uh, from Ed's career or, or lack thereof that may be discovered someday because it'd be amazing to stumble across something. In fact, I'm not going to mention his name because uh, he doesn't want it getting out there too much. But the other day I met with somebody who pulled out his cell phone to show me some pictures and they were pictures of a film that he had managed to stumble across a 16 millimeter print of one of Ed Wood's stag reels <laughs> that had been lost for a very, very long time. Now some shots of it or scans of it have turned up online, but it's like an eight minute reel of one of his porns from later in his career in which Ed Wood actually appears in the film. He goes shirtless and he wears a sombrero. So I'll just say that. So, I mean, there's a chance maybe some Edward stuff will turn up someday. <laughs> For that matter, you know, with his various pen names and aliases, maybe yeah. there's stuff we don't know that it was Ed. That's a, that's a tantalizing thought. I uh, mean, he clearly co-wrote Night of the Living Dead, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah, he and George were working on that for years together. Um, <laughs> it does kind of make you wonder. At some point, did Ramiro see this movie in 1960? Didn't think much of it. But, I mean, you know, admittedly, the, it's just a cast-off line that I think a newsman delivers in Night of the Living Dead. But it's it's just funny. That one little line just, you know, has always resonated with me. It's like, oh, these aren't just ordinary ghouls. They're space ghouls. <laughs> And uh, so to me, yeah, it's it's as it's as plain as uh, the khaki uniform on Lyle Talbot that 
you know, these two movies are connected. It's part of the great undead UFO conspiracy that no one wants to talk about. <laughs> the next time I see Tom Savini, I know what I'm asking him. Hey, he's going to be a Monster Bash man. I know. He's always a Monster Bash, but he's going to be a Monster Bash, so we'll ask him. <laughs> wow. Let me know. <laughs> Because uh, uh, John Russo is going to be there, too. We can ask him. <laughs> oh, I'm sure they'll both appreciate this. <laughs> Tell you what, Scott, yeah. when we do this, you ask them separately, and then I'll go up to him a second, a different day and ask them as well, <laughs> so that it seems like it's more than just one weirdo. <laughs> yeah, it's, part, it's, it's a whole movement that we're starting. <laughs> <laughs> Well, this past summer's Monster Bash has come and gone, and I can only speak for myself. I did not approach Tom Savini or John Russo and ask them about the Plan 9 Night of the Living Dead connection. Whether or not Scott did, well... So, Plan 9 from Outer Space begat Night of the Living Dead. Night of the Living Dead begat basically the entire modern zombie movement. So, we have Ed Wood to thank for everything from Return of the Living Dead to The Walking Dead on television. Thank you, Ed. So does this make Ed Wood a new patron saint of Monster Kid Radio? <laughs> yeah, why not? I'll give it that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. why not? I'll, I'll, I can go with that. I can go with that. I don't know if I'm going to put him right up there with Karloff Lugosi and John Agar, <laughs> but he's there. He's up there. I put him on Mount Rushmore, have him wearing an Angora sweater. Of he's, course. You know, he's one of our heroes. Okay, uh, so you know, if we were was... going to make an Ed Wood style Mount Rushmore, so obviously Ed Wood would be on it. But what would be the other three faces if it was all Ed Wood stuff? Bella Lugosi, Lugosi, Tor Johnson, and Tor Johnson. Okay. Well, I feel like you'd you'd almost have to have Vampira there. Yeah. No, I was, she only I was in the one movie. She, yeah, she only. Well, she. Uh, I mean, Vampira was in. Um, uh, just as an aside, she was in a great exploitation movie called The Beat Generation. Sure, uh, but but with that, she only did the one, right? Yeah, just the one. So yeah, I mean, yeah, Tor, Tor and Bella had a... Uh, they were both in Bride of the Monster, too. Yeah. Yeah, that's true. And Glenn or Glenda for Bella, so... Yeah. I was just thinking about, you know, some of the other filmmakers who you could compare with to Ed, like, say, Al Adamson oh. and Ted V. Michaels. Oh. Feel, <laughs> like... Oh, man. You know... That's for zombie action. There, there you go. More, more undead. More zombies. So. Yeah. In a, in a perfect world, there's a, a wax museum somewhere that has a, uh, you know, Schlockmeister B-movie Hall of Fame. And so you have these wax statues of Ed and, you know, Al Adamson and, and uh, Ted B. Michaels and Herschel Gordon Lewis is in there. And, you know, and Tommy Wiseau so takes the tickets, right? Yeah, no, no, yeah. Yeah, it's, it's <laughs> welcome to Tommy Wiseau's Wax Museum of Horror. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> the thing is, is if we could figure out how to get a hold of him, he'd probably shoot that video with us. And this is, <laughs> yeah. We should make a little video for that. See, again, Brett, we should have talked to you before we launched the Kickstarter because all these ideas are gold and would have made perfect stretch goals. I'm just saying. <laughs> you know, if there's any, well, I mean, think. let's think about it because, you know, the, you haven't released the show yet. So maybe you could do an extra, you know, there's still, there's still time. <laughs> there's still time. We could make this happen. Wow. Okay, well, are there any other takeaways from this particular section of the film uh, before we start bringing this to a close? That's that's the question. Is there anything we'd want to take away? <laughs> I mean, I, I think we would just, we'll leave it for future generations. I think the only takeaway that we actually talked about was the tunic. We would take that away. Well, there you go. There you go. And I do find it interesting, too, that unprompted, our guests keep bringing up this conspiracy angle. And it's something that I hadn't considered about the film until we started doing this particular podcast, that there are so many elements of the the UFO conspiracy and what's going on here and, and all this kind of weird stuff happening in the background. And Brett brought it up in this episode, too. So, I mean, apparently yeah. it's a through line in this film that I never really picked up on. Yeah. And I, and I like that a lot. There's that. And I think almost every one of our guests have also said that this movie is not as bad as people think it is. That has come up many times as well, and I think that's awesome. Yeah. You know, in the 70s, you know, this movie in some ways kicked off that kitsch interest in bad movies. But, yeah, since then, you know, we've we've seen them. <laughs> we've, <laughs> we've gone down that road. And, you know, yeah, Plan 9, uh, you know, again, I feel like it's just this really crazy movie. It's got all this manic energy and, and these thoroughly wacky you know, individuals who came together to make this movie. And here you go. 
it really is, even though it's not the last film in Ed Wood genre filmmaking career, it really does feel like the, the perfect mix and culmination of everything that Ed Wood was about when he was trying to make these genre movies. It's, it's got all the players in place, even players who only appeared in this film like Vampire. We got Tor Johnson, we got Lugosi, we've got Paul Marco and Conrad Brooks. We've got everything here. This is the perfect encapsulation, I feel like, of everything that Ed Wood was about. Yeah, maybe some other movies were more competently made. Bride of the Monster comes to mind being a little more competently made. A Night of the Ghouls is also an underrated gem. But this one, I think, really kind of defines Ed Wood for so many people, and, and rightly so. This is his opus. This is the one he'll be remembered for. Yes. <laughs> to quote that Ed Wood movie. <laughs> right. Yep. <laughs> yep. And, and I, I, maybe the last thing I'll say about this movie is you got to love it. Again, there's this energy. Sure, there's all kinds of gaffes and stuff, but it just makes you smile. This movie is a rescue dog. You know, it's, it's, that, it's that scrawny <laughs> mutt you bring home and, oh, he made a mess on the carpet again. Oh, you, <laughs> I love you so much. <laughs> You know, you just can't help but love this little movie as sort of the pathetic little orphan that it is. Yeah. And, you know, and ultimately, here we are 60 years later, and you guys are doing a whole series about it, and people are still watching it and discovering it. And here's to the, you know, the future generation who's going to do the 100th anniversary of Plan 9. Oh, I hope I'm around for that. Heck well, yeah. Well, Brett, you've just... Uh... Uh, settled in my mind why I like this movie so much because I have had several rescue dogs in my life so I feel perfect <laughs> now why why I like this yeah there you go yeah there you go man as crazy as this may sound there's something I'm gonna say it probably a, a word that has never been associated with Plan Nine heartwarming you know, what you, <laughs> you, know you just want to pat this movie on the head and say you goofy little guy. Yeah, go, go ahead. Film another graveyard scene. Oh, a, another tombstone fell down. Oh, you know, you little you little scamp. Go ahead. <laughs> we'll do better it, in the next shot. It's okay. Yeah, it's, it's okay. Especially if you go back and you look at the whole production of this movie. If you add that in, it's easy to get that feeling for this movie. Because you realize all of the obstacles that Ed Wood and his troop had to go through to get this movie made. Very true. I don't have the energy or the strength or, or the time to do it, but there are people online that recut movie trailers to make the film feel like it's in a different genre. You know, such and such cut as a horror, like the shining shot as a, a redone as a family film. That's my of. favorite is Mary Poppins shot as a horror movie. Right. And I want to see nice. plan nine from outer space, a trailer for it, reframing it as like a romantic comedy or, or like a kid's family movie or something. Brett used the word heartwarming and just my mind expanded. It's like, I want to see that now. <laughs> so any listeners out there who feel like they've got enough time to whip something like that up, I'd love to see it. And now I want a Pixar version of Plan 9. Oh, my God. Oh, wow. The old man from Up Styled is Tor Johnson. Yeah, yes. I'm, I'm, I'm all in. I'm all in. <laughs> well, Scott, you're the Disney guy. Maybe you can call, make some calls and make that happen. <laughs> Well, Brett, this has been awesome. I've had a blast chatting with you, man. This is the second time you and I have podcasted together because, like I said, uh, you brought me on to one of your podcasts, the Five Minutes of Bonsai podcast, which really whet my appetite for this style of podcasting. So I got to thank you for that. And listeners, ultimately, you have Brett and his partner. Uh, Josh Horowitz. My Josh Horowitz. Josh Horowitz. For bringing uh, me on to their podcast and making me want to do a podcast like this. Yeah. Yeah. The, the, the whole movie. It's Brett's fault. <laughs> Kind of is, kind of is. Yeah, it's, it's, it, it is kind of wacky because the whole movie minute format, when you try to explain it to somebody, like I'm picturing you pitching it to Scott. I was like, wait, we're, we're, we, you want to talk about plan nine? Yeah. Minute by minute. It sounds crazy, but if you love movies, it, it's like Legos or a nice model kit because you can kind of disassemble and yeah, you could talk about, you know, who did the score or, you know, you really get into the movie locations and all those little tiny tidbits. So sure. really dive into uh, the minutia of it. And you're not far off because I think, I, Scott, you had never done anything like this before. And I don't think you even listened to anything like this before when no, I got you No, no, this is, this is all news to me. And one of the things that I've really liked about this specifically is the fact that we've done them out of order. And I think that makes you 
pay more attention to each individual nine minutes and not really, okay, I've, I've watched this one record, watch this one record, and you end up thinking of the whole movie. You're spending more time thinking of each one individually, and I think that's helped us understand and appreciate this movie better. It really has. So I want to thank you publicly on the podcast, Brett, for introducing me to this format uh, proper. I mean, I knew about the format, but I never really got into that that field of podcasting. So, Brett, thank you. Thanks for having me. 